All right, so uh, today's talk is called Take the Pink Pill, uh, subtitle Why Best Practices Are Dead Ends. And my name's Adam Brock. I'm the founder of Hypermatic, which we'll learn a little bit more uh, as the show goes on. So the five bullet overview is I worked in digital and uh, advertising agencies for a decade. I was a designer and developer, so sort of this weirdo that was really interested in both things when most people kind of aren't interested in them if they're uh, one or the other. So I used to co-run the Design Ops Meetup uh, with Chan. So I ran that for about a year with him, and then I quit the Design Ups Meetup, and then I quit my job uh, the week after Figma plugins were announced and decided to uh, found a startup building Figma plugins full-time. Uh, so this is what the uh, meetup looked like uh, in 2018. Uh, we started it as the most dangerous design meetup in Melbourne, uh, not for the threat of physical violence, but just uh, the, as we'll see as the talk goes along, uh, if you actually want to do anything interesting or important uh, in these companies or your company, uh, the risk of doing so is actually so high uh, that only a few people in this room would probably be willing to uh, go that far. So uh, just a quick show of hands, who read the code of conduct policy before uh, arriving? Literally zero. Uh, so. Uh, basically, there was a bit of an ultimatum where uh, we were either going to uh, be bullied into adding a code of conduct policy on the website, uh, which I didn't think would make any difference, um, or I just said I'd just kind of go, go do something else. So I um, uh, decided to just go do something else. And um, so uh, it's no longer the most dangerous, but uh, it is still pretty based. Uh, so I started a company uh, which is called Hypermatic, used to be called Figmatic, uh, which was named after Illmatic, uh, my favorite uh, Nas album. And uh, I uh, got a very nicely worded letter from the Figma legal team uh, saying I had seven days to rebrand. So uh, I uh, spent seven days, uh, read about 10 books on branding, uh, did this crazy uh, script where I uh, you know, wrote down all the possible name combinations for the domain, uh, paid like 20 grand to this guy who owned hypermatic.com and uh, here we are. So um, the, the quickest way to find it is if you just Google Agile is for losers and click I'm feeling lucky. Uh, <laughs> Uh, hypermatic.com will be will be number one so um, and if you're interested you can read about my decade-long frustrations with the uh, destructive cult of agile infiltrating digital agency environments so as I said uh, we built Figma plugins that turn designers into superhumans uh, really the goal is to help uh, designers spend less time crying and more time designing uh, so kind of getting out of the corner or under the table, you know, w wanting to go home and actually enjoying their job rather than doing all these meaningless uh, tasks. So uh, we've got 12 Figma plugins so far. Uh, we'll be at a million users by Christmas and I'll be giving demos of half of them at the end of this talk. So there'll be uh, six demos that we'll run through and uh, I think that'll be pretty interesting if you enjoyed the last talk. So I wear many uh, jumpsuits. Uh, this is me in my kitchen, and then uh, that's also me in my kitchen. Uh, that's me in my kitchen on the right playing Nintendo, and that's me in the kitchen uh, not being on the phone to anyone. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, we have no meetings. Uh, there's no investors. There's no Agile. There's no Jira boards, uh, which means there's no distractions. So I basically get to do whatever I want all day uh, because I just say no to everything that I don't like. Um, and it's amazing how much you can get done, even as a company of one, uh, when you have literally 10 hours of free time every day to work on whatever you want. Uh, you would never go back if you understood how good this uh, reality was. Um, so my only employee is a fake monkey assistant, uh, baby chimp called Dennis. So on my contact page, uh, basically you're directed to him. So uh, we've trained this baby chimp to help intercept messages. He prints them off. Uh, on paper for me and then expertly laminates them and hand delivers them to me. So people actually address Dennis in the emails and uh, you know tell him to make sure that the message is going to get to me. They draw him bananas, they send him love letters, like this chimp gets more attention than I do. But uh, anyway, so uh, Dennis, you know, my customers love him, but uh, that's kind of the way it is. So just a quick show of hands. Um, I think we're basically mostly all designers here. Um, so I just wanted to get a quick check of, just out of my own interest, like who talks to real users multiple times a day uh, as a designer? Uh, so one at the back. And then I guess we can extend that out to like a week, like in an average week, would, would you talk to multiple users? So one other guy. Um, what about like per month? Would you be talking to real users every month? Maybe six people, okay. Yeah, so it's, it's this sort of this weird paradox where we, we always claim that we're you know, human-centered designers, and yet I found that consistently um, the designers never talk to any humans. And um, 
in, in a weird way, that's a little bit depressing. You could almost think of the sales and marketing team being more human-centered than everyone else um, because they are actually talking to users every day. They understand the uh, intricacies of their problems. Uh, the support team probably knows more than any designer actually would, and I, I think that's a little bit strange. Um, so being the only employee at my uh, company, uh, I've talked with thousands of Figma users from all over the world over the last few years, and I've, I've learned a lot of stuff. Uh, but the two key takeaways that's very consistent is that uh, everyone is actually doing their best. So everyone is actually really trying pretty hard to make things work. Uh, but also nobody's figured it out yet. Even if you, uh, you know, get a peek into all these huge companies that you'd know, uh, the big tech companies, everyone, nobody actually has it uh, quite figured out yet. So uh, this section, we're just going to be dispensing some red pills and following the rabbit, white rabbit uh, into the matrix. So uh, everyone's familiar with the matrix. You get to take the red pill uh, and see these uncomfortable truths, or you can take the blue pill and go back to dreamland and uh, kind of wake up and forget about it all. But if you actually upscale the 4K Blu-ray, you can see the contents of the blue pill. Um, and it's not something that we want to be ingesting. It's this sickly sweet file format that uh, has been kind of lingering around for the last 20 years. And even though we think we've kind of purged it, uh, it's still around just in a different form. And so we need to get rid of this decrepit uh, ideology that's kind of been, you know, uh, festering away in, uh, in our systems for the last two decades. And so what I mean by uh, sort of this blue pill analogy is that uh, we've basically come to accept that drawing rectangles in Figma uh, that we then hand off to be recreated in a different medium is kind of just normal, like we just kind of almost don't even think twice about it, and I think that's sort of disturbing. Uh, and if you kind of look to the Truman Show uh, analogy, you know, we accept the reality of the world which we're presented. A lot of people are new to the industry, you know, they, that's just the way we've always done it, so we might as well just keep doing it that way. Uh, but unfortunately, I think this is really uh, not going to be a good uh, approach for the future. So talking about best practices, I think you can kind of think about it on two ends. So at one end, you've got extreme dogma where nothing can be questioned because we know everything is uh, certain. We've reached absolute truths. There's no point questioning them. Uh, and then on the other end of the extreme, you've got uh, doubt. So nothing can be certain. You know, I'm not wearing this ridiculous uniform. You're not actually all here. And uh, nothing can be certain at all. So both ends of the extreme are actually quite dangerous. On one end, you uh, can't question anything, so you don't do anything. And on the other end, uh, nothing can be certain, so why even bother? Um, and I think best practices have gone way too far over to the dogma side, and we need to kind of nudge it back the other way. So uh, the, pic the founder of Pixar uh, kind of describes this when they were working on, working on two Toy Story 2, uh, where trust the process had become this mantra, and it was this crutch that was distracting them from actually engaging with their problems. And his position was we should actually trust in people, not processes. Uh, but a reason why we have best practices is because it's actually really hard to do new things inside and outside of companies, uh, as you would know, and as, as I know. Um, so you barely have any time to do your job. I mean, it's just unreal how much uh, non-design work or how much non-interesting uh, work we actually have to do at, at our jobs, let alone innovate or take any risk. And the risk factor is what I was mentioning before. So you can think about this on a sort of four by four grid, where at the top you've got the idea of trying something new, uh, but if you fail, you're viewed as an idiot and you'll probably lose your job. But even if you succeed and try something new, you basically gain almost no credit. Uh, whereas if you follow best practices and you fail, uh, you know, you follow the best practice and you, you're basically just seen as being unlucky and you get to keep your job. Uh, and if you succeed, you also get to keep your job. And so the risk reward asymmetry is just totally out of whack to actually even be incentivized to try anything new. Um, but I'm also interested in where do these best practices even come from? You know, we kind of inherit them, we don't really think too much about them. Uh, this is a, a very short list, you know, you could go on forever about this, but I've only got 30 minutes. So I'm just going to really briefly cover four of them. Uh, I deleted 40 slides last night to try and make this point, but hopefully we can get there with just one example of each. So uh, we can just, I guess, start with ex experts. Um, and what if they're actually wrong? You know, what if we're just receiving all this wisdom from all these people? We think have it all figured out, and actually they, they don't. Um, so we can flash back, you know, to 2000, the uh, Y2K. And there was this internet article, uh, article about the internet, which claimed that 
it actually is probably just going to be this passing fad because everyone's kind of giving up on it. Really, it's only just teenagers playing on Neopets and all this sort of stuff. There's no commercial application whatsoever. Newspapers will never go online. Music will never go online, you know, this sort of stuff. Um, and the people who came up with this were, they literally called themselves experts from the Virtual Society Project, which was uh, these groups of people from 25 universities across the US and Europe uh, who, you know, dozens of people all agreeing that, you know, the internet, don't worry about it, it's just a passing fad, it's teenagers playing Neopets or whatever. Um, so in that case, uh, if you would just bet uh, the opposite of exactly everything they predicted would happen, uh, you would be a billionaire. Um, this also applies to the industry. So we kind of look at industry standards, the industry, you know, they must have it figured out, you know, industry practice, whatever. And one example of this, is if, if you remember the Spotify model back when I was in agencies, uh, it seemed like every second person I talked to at different agencies was about to adopt the Spotify model, this tribes model. And it's like, it was just so dumb at the time. But uh, in retrospect, uh, the people who were part of it at Spotify ended up writing an article to clarify it because they got so sick of people copying this model. And they actually wrote an article saying Spotify doesn't use the Spotify model and neither should you. Uh, and some of the key quotes from the article were, even at the time we wrote it, we weren't doing it. Um, so they put out this big you know, manifesto on this Spotify model and they weren't even practicing it at the time. And then he kind of finishes by saying, it worries me when people look at what we do and think that it's just a framework they can copy and implement. And this is kind of, kind of getting at the crux of what I'm trying to uh, uh, discredit about, you know, just blindly following best practice. You know, in this case, it didn't even exist, let alone there was nothing to copy in the first place. Um, so just a quick show of hands, who is a Donald Trump fan? One, okay. Are you serious or just kidding? Half, half, okay, cool. Anyway, so one out of 150 is you know pretty low ratio. Um, I took bets before, and we both uh, said it would be zero. But anyway, I'm not trying to stir up debate or anything. I'm just I'm just trying to make the point that um, a it's kind of weird that we just automatically assumed that no one would would put their hand up. Um, but what's more interesting is the reason why. And I think a lot of what can describe this uh, when you look back at the, you know the whole Trump phenomenon, the Brexit stuff, like all the crazy stuff that kind of seemed so out of left field. Uh, I'm pretty convinced can be explained in large part through preference falsification. So what is preference falsification? Uh, so it's, it's essentially misrepresenting one's wants under perceived social pressures. And what this results in is a public preference that is actually at odds with private preference and there's no way to kind of gauge it. So it's, it's slightly different from lying, but it's, it's kind of in the same ballpark. And this can extends even further. You know, there's these famous experiments, the Ash Conformity experiments, where they would take, you know, five or six people who are all paid actors, and then they'd hire one person who had no idea what was going on, put them at the end of those people, and they would do question after question of these basic, you know, obvious questions, and the first five or six would answer the deliberately wrong question, uh, wrong answer. So they would say in exhibit one, oh yes, that's definitely line C. They would all say it, and then you get to the guy at the end who has no idea what's happening. And they did this time and time again, and 75% of people knowingly gave at least uh, multiple wrong answers, you know, knowingly. And the reason they gave was they just wanted to fit in, you know, they didn't want to cause any trouble, they didn't want to be seen as stupid, all this sort of stuff. So they actually went against what they could see with their own eyes just to fit in. So I think there's this really weird dynamic with groups where you go from the wisdom of crowds to the madness of crowds very quickly. Um, and so I think this also extends to innovation. Uh, you know, we, same sort of thing. We hear this best practice. It's be best practice to get a bunch of people in a room to innovate. You know, as if sitting down for 30 minutes with 12 people is going to lead to anything. And the reason for that is that there's all these factors at play that totally derail that and sabotage it. You've got a natural authority hierarchy where there's junior people, there's senior people, the CEO might be there. Uh, the meeting is always dominated by a few pieces of shit who just won't shut up. And... Um, won't let anyone else talk. This is especially uh, common if there's, you know, guys and girls in the room. Some guy will just overtake, you know, won't let anyone else talk. Um, there's the fear of social rejection, as we just said. Bike shedding, uh, which is the idea that uh, meetings always gravitate towards spending a disproportionate amount of time on the most trivial shit. So they'll be talking about building a nuclear power plant and, uh, you know, it's an hour meeting and they spend the first 55 minutes talking about where to put the bike shed out front. And so that's where the term comes from. And so what ends up happening in these groups is you actually end up with the average opinion of the average person. Uh, and that basically leads to this, um, which is just dog shit. I mean, look at it. It's like every website at some point was just looks like this. And you can't even actually tell. If you removed all the logos, 
you wouldn't know which website is which. They have absolutely no brand, no sense of self-identity. And this is a reflection of what happens in these brainstorming groups. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the strongest things I'm convinced of is that a lot of this can be described through uh, this innate mimetic desire that we all share. Uh, so there's this famous um, author, maybe not so famous, but uh, Rene Girard, who discovered that the mo most of what we desire is actually mimetic and not intrinsic. And that imitation actually plays a far more pervasive role in our society than er anyone else had ever openly acknowledged. And so what, what happens is people are just intrinsically, uh, you know, kind of on autopilot to just desire what other people are doing. And it leads to things like this. So you get, you know, um, the exact same Instagram photos. You get Airbnbs, an interior design that all looks identical. You get car manufacturers that used to be able to uh, be defined by what country they were made in. And now every single country just looks exactly the same. Uh, cafes all look identical. And even brands have fallen into this trap. These are toothbrush brands. Every single brand up here is a different brand. Are you to tell me that every single one of these brands got together, came up with these unique strategies independently of each other at different periods in time, and all deployed them at the same time? There's just no way. They're all copying each other. And this just happens like ongoing, like every day. And so I think this diversity um, rhetoric, maybe this is also a best practice that we need to question. You know, does getting enough war veterans in the room with enough you know, other people representative of the overall population actually lead to innovation? And it's this uncomfortable question that we sort of ask, but I think in a way the rhetoric around this is distracting us from all these forces that are actually pulling us away from being able to innovate. And I don't think it's as simple as this. And so if you were to uh, you know, think about well, okay, well, what is actually the opposite of diversity? Um, you know, I think you would pretty much land on university. And, um, and so, you know, you've got this weird sort of uh, uh, Borg-like factory that's producing copies of copies of people. And this, it leads to this kind of, uh, you know, thing where we, we're actually getting the opposite of what we want. Instead of getting a bunch of people who all uh, think differently, we ended up getting, you know, all these people who think exactly the same. And so uh, if we take some uh, copy from one of the most prominent uh, boot camps, UX boot camps, you know, they claim to curate the best practices and innovative teaching approaches of their entire expert network, um, which sounds amazing. So what are those uh, you know, best practices? Well, taken from this week, it's getting hands-on experience with eating leading industry software like Sketch and Envision. And so this is all terribly broken. And I think that uh, you know we've kind of distracted ourselves with all these things to try and convince ourselves that everything's you know normal. We don't really have to do much. You know we've we've kind of set it on all these absolute truths. There's really no point of doing much more. Uh, we've got all these best practices that we've learned in university and in the workplace. Uh, we've got group consensus on everything. So you know there's really not too much to worry about. But I think we really do need to get back to the future. And I believe that the way out is to accelerate. So we need to go back to the other side. We need to get away from the extreme of dogma and we need to go back to the side of doubt where we can start rethinking some of these things because everything is not certain. We're not at the end of history. And I think React kind of proves this. If you remember when React came out, there was a very strong visceral negative reaction in the developer community from it. It was seen as crazy. And this tweet is kind of a joke at what they were doing uh, when they announced it. This, this person's like, you know, Facebook, rethink established best practices, you know, ma basically making a joke of React. And now you'd be struggling to find a developer who didn't agree that that was obviously the right thing to, to move in a direction of. And so I was kind of trying to talk about this in 2018. I gave a talk called Insanely Inevitable. And uh, I was sort of saying that you know machine learning, AI, and automation are actually super underestimated in uh, design. And I remember talking to people afterwards, and they just kind of were, you know, half of them were laughing at me, half of them didn't quite understand what I was saying. Um, but now I think it's kind of happening. And I made the joke at the time that, you know, we really haven't done ourselves any favors to avoid the machines taking over um, when we basically just design the same stuff over and over. And all that's changed since then is we just copy different things. So this is the linear, you know, style that linear kind of came up with. So every single tech platform now just looks like linear. Um, which again, they obviously independently came up with in their own group settings when they were innovating, but they all happened to ship it all at the same time. So, you know, it was just that linear kind of got unlucky with the timing. But um, and even the reactionary sort of movement to this sameness, uh, the brutalist kind of ideas, you know, 
in theory, it kind of works because you're doing the opposite, but you can't just add a negative sign in front of what we're not happy with um, because what happens is they also copy each other and they al also look all the same. Uh, again, this sort of mimetic desire is just inescapable. So I think that AI will essentially be a forcing function to upend some of our best practices. This stuff is not going anywhere uh, and we can already see based on the very early concepts that uh, it's going to be a real, a real game changer. And I've just got one example here, which is Galileo AI, uh, developed by, founded by a few people from Facebook. So this is them uh, describing an, uh, an app that they want, a UI. And this is creating real Figma designs and also code. So in this sense, they're describing an onboarding flow with these certain fields. So it gives you the, gives you the UI. So this is all being designed uh, automatically. And this is a reading app featuring a certain author and a list of their books. So. You know, I, I think that, um, you know, we don't need to panic about this, but I think it is worth acknowledging that we are not at the end. This is, you know, this stuff is kind of coming and we can't just be kind of complacent and expect that nothing is going to change. And this is also the worst that AI is ever going to be. You know, don't make the mistake of trying to, you know, cope with, you know, what the future might hold. Uh, you know, I've got this article saved from last year where this illustrator's article was why AI will never take my job as an illustrator. And he was uh, basically showing that his drawing on the left of the illustration and the illustration that the AI came up with, you know, was obviously a piece of shit. And it's just, it's never going to get better. So this is obviously as good as it's going to get. Therefore, I can assure you it's impossible to create a professional and useful image from a text, text description. But failing to see that, you know, progress is not linear. In this case, it was actually exponential. Six months later, you could do this. And so this illustrator, you know, I don't know what they've done now. Maybe they've jumped out the window. But anyway, <laughs> they've, um, the, you can see clearly, like you can do illustration, you can do interior, photorealistic shots, you can do photorealistic portraits, you know, grayscale sketches, all this crazy stuff. The point is that, you know, you have to kind of think past the immediate and think into what, what, what is actually the exponential version of what we're looking at. And so again, I'm not going to go through all this. Just, this is really just a bit of a brain dump of what AI could be applied to. And it's really just everything, you know, uh, UI design, documentation, vectors, uh, design to code, accessibility, video and audio generation, self-improving A-B tests that you can just kind of let, let loose, uh, user testing and insights and summarizing things, uh, design linting, translations, localizations, all this sort of stuff. So now we come to the conclusion of the talk, which is the demo uh, portion where I try to convince you to take the pink pill. You know, all this AI stuff, it's, it's here, it's getting tons of investment. There's lots of very smart people working on it. It's not here right now, but it's trending in that direction. Uh, but in the meantime, this is some of the stuff that I've been doing. So I believe that the distance between design and production should actually be zero. None of this bridge the gap shit. It's like we don't need more red lines. We don't need, you know, um, diagrams with where the paddings needs to go. No developers like that stuff. Just give us the code. Like, you know, we don't want to do that. And so I think that we should never send a human to do a machine's job. And what I mean by that is not this idea of, you know, replacing jobs or taking over designers jobs. I don't, I don't agree with that at all. I think that uh, AI and computers can be very complementary to what we need to do uh, as creative people and as developers. And so I think we just want to take the parts that make sense for a computer to handle and let humans do the creative side and work in complementary uh, fashion with each other. Uh, so as I mentioned, it's, it's basically demo time. So we're going to uh, go into Super Saiyan mode and uh, look at half a dozen Figma plugins uh, that uh, I built. So the first one is Pitch Deck. Uh, this is where you can magically turn your Figma designs into stunning presentations or export them to PowerPoint. And that's what I'm running now. And I can prove it to you because it's the only presentation software on the market where you can use a Nicolas Cage uh, laser pointer. Uh, or I guess you could use Doge. Uh, or this one is kind of batshit. I kind of like that one. Uh, anyway, there's a whole host of different features to play around with. Uh, I was also going to use my phone as a remote, but the gloves don't really work with it. So um, anyway, this is going to be a, a quick demo of, of how it looks in Figma. Um, so I'm going to get a bit meta and show you the presentation I designed in Figma, which is this presentation. And you can do things like apply animations to it. It's just kind of like you know using Keynote and Figma almost. But you can use all of your existing designs in Figma. You can embed videos. You can basically embed anything. You can embed websites, you know, Canva. You can embed Figma prototypes. Uh, there's a lot of supported embeds that you can drop in. Uh, so it adds a bit more flexibility. You can see analytics of your presentation. So this is my web presentation that I'm presenting now. Uh, you can see exactly which slide you know, was viewed most, how long uh, was spent on them. A lot of uh, interesting stats you can look at. 
And then here, uh, you can either upload it to a web presentation, or in this case, I'm going to show you how to export it to a PowerPoint file. You can also export it for Keynote, Google Slides, PDF, all this sort of stuff. But just taking the same design from Figma and automatically doing all the you know work that we want a machine to do instead. So it's just exported the PowerPoint file. So I'm going to open that up now. And you can see it's a one-to-one -one copy uh, of the uh, design that we exported from Figma. And this is fully editable, so you can uh, jump into the text layers. You can edit content. So if you're working with teams uh, who don't use Figma or can't use Figma and they require PowerPoint, you can do all your design work in Figma, get all the benefits of that, and then send it to people on your team who, uh, sales team or whoever, and they can actually make content updates uh, in in uh, in PowerPoint or Google Slides or Keynote, whatever they prefer. So um, that's something you can do using that plugin. So I think this is almost finished. Yeah, yeah. you can obviously change fonts and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that's one down. Uh, number two uh, is Bannerify, and so this allows you to animate and export. Uh, production-ready banners from Figma to either HTML, uh, GIFs, or video formats. Uh, so we'll jump into that one as well. You'll notice these are all very agency-specific uh, because that's my uh, kind of background. Um, so again, you can use your uh, designs. I've just got a bunch of Figma frames, uh, all designed, and you can animate the banners directly in Figma using the plugin. So it's a full uh, timeline. You can jump into any layer. You can bulk apply animations, so you don't have to go layer by layer. Uh, it's pretty quick if you want to make changes to animations. And there's tons of presets. You can also create your own totally custom animation timelines as well. But in this case, I'm happy with it, so I'm going to export it for Google Ads. There's about 20 different platforms you can export it for, tons of different configuration options. But I'm just going to download it now and unzip that. only takes a few seconds to export. And this is production-ready code. All the click tags, all the CSS, all the JavaScript, all the HTML, all the image assets. Uh, you can have nine banners in this case. You can have 900 banners if you want. You can export as many as you want uh, in one go. And if we open that up in the browser, uh, we get this neat preview page that we can send to clients so they can look at every single banner uh, in one view. And you've got production-ready HTML banners uh, exported from Figma in about three seconds. And so the neat part about that is you'll know if you've ever worked on a banner campaign, they have about 7,000 rounds, rounds of changes. And so if you're a developer on the other end of that, you know, it's pretty easy to make changes in Figma, you know, as I just did, you just make a color change. But if you're changing layers around, removing stuff, it's a, it's a bit of a nightmare for a developer to then go in and re-export that, uh, all those assets, figure out the new CSS positions, elements, all that sort of stuff. So now I'm just re-exporting the entire banner campaign again with that color change. And you can see how quickly it is uh, for making iterations on your banner sets. Yep, so this is the new set with the purple button. So, you know, again, we basically uh, animated and exported and changed and re-exported a banner campaign in about 90 seconds flat. So this is uh, extremely useful if you're doing banner campaigns at scale and uh, don't want to bother your developers with uh, coding these things. Uh, so the next one will kind of alternate between code and non-code uh, stuff. So this one's called Commentful. Uh, it allows you to supercharge your Figma comments and also gather feedback uh, from stakeholders without them needing to use Figma. So it does a, it does a few different things. Uh, the first thing is it allows you to take your native Figma comments and put them into a custom Kanban board or Trello style board. So you can actually put them in swim lanes, see where all the comments are at. You can add to-dos to each column, so subtasks, and assign them to people. So when they go to their own to-dos tab, they can see what's waiting for them for each comment, and it marks that off uh, on the overall board as well. So you can actually see where the actual status of every comment is. And then you can put them into your own totally customizable uh, swim lanes. So kind of to keep track of your uh, things. And then you can also create review links. So these are shareable links that you can send to stakeholders or anybody. And it allows you to up upload your designs, uh, whatever artboards you want, uh, in a static way where it's not the live Figma design. It's a snapshot in time that you want to get feedback on. And then all you need to do is you can optionally personalize the link, send it to the reviewer. They can just drop it into their browser. No accounts, no logins or um, passwords needed. And then they can basically go in and leave comments directly on the design. So you can, uh, you can format the comments. You can drop them anywhere you want and uh, submit them as you'd expect. But then the slightly different part is that you can also leave specific types of feedback. So you can automatically click on any text area, uh, change the text to whatever you want uh, to give feedback on it. 
So in this case, we're clicking on the layer, it's automatically populating the text. We just make changes to it, submit the change request, and same is true for images. So if you want to uh, swap out an image or tell them that you want a new image, you just drop that into the uh, area that you've clicked, the actual uh, image layer. And then when we go back to Figma, all of that uh, feedback is coming into the plugin in real time, in context, so you can see exactly what all the feedback is. Uh, you can interact with it, so you can reply to the comments, so the stakeholder can uh, uh, have a bit of a dialogue with you. And you can do that vice versa, it's all in real time. So you can leave uh, comments on those. And then if we jump back into Figma, uh, the cool part is you don't actually have to manually action any of this feedback. Uh, because it's context uh, specific to the design, all you need to do is click on one button that says update in Figma and it'll automatically make the text changes for you. So you can basically just go down and knock, knock out all of your content changes from clients or stakeholders uh, with one button and that'll automatically update content, automatically check it out for you. Same thing with images, you just click one button and it will automatically apply the requested images. Um, and that'll allow you to, um, yeah, really easily knock out any client feedback, right? really putting the onus on them and you not having to trawl through 50,000 uh, Word documents with you know assets as screenshots or printed off and then rescanned in as JPEGs or something, um, or things like that. So anyway, that was the comment, uh, comment full one. Uh, this is a fairly new one, it's actually still in beta. Uh, I kind of shipped it, I always ship stuff that I'm not quite uh, happy with, so this one's about you know basically 5% of where I eventually wanted to get it to, this is just one uh, feature at the moment. This eventually will just be a very small portion of the plugin, uh, but for now it allows you to inspect your Figma layers as HTML, Tailwind, React or View code uh, with one click. So you can load up your designs. Again, uh, if you're a developer, you don't want to have to get handoff documents. Just click the element, get the code, uh, and you can also preview it. So if you want to preview it in line, uh, you can see what that's going to look like on different uh, sizes. So you can jump in there and uh, check out the HTML before you use it. And again, you can select whatever language you want. So just uh, jump in if you need React, select React, copy it to your clipboard, drop it in. If you want to download the zip with any image assets, uh, you can just do that with one click as well. Uh, as I said, this one's very early, but uh, I think it's going to be it's going to be quite useful once the full kind of version of it uh, comes out. Uh, this is also a cat doing all of this, so it's very easy to use. Um, uh, even even a cat can do it. So, okay, so that was Weblify. Okay, the next one is called Convertify. So this is uh, a plugin that allows you to import and export designs into Figma and out of Figma uh, with one click. So I'll show you just three formats. There's a bunch of different formats you can select. Uh, but in this case, I'm going to export uh, this particular design to uh, Adobe XD, we should be surprised uh, actually how many people need to do this. Um, so this will convert my Figma design, give me an XD file. In this case, you know, it took about three seconds. And we can open that up and we've got all of our layers, all of our structure, uh, all of the content uh, intact. So we can now take that into XD, continue working on it there for whatever reason, you know, working with other, other clients and stuff. Uh, and same, uh, it goes in reverse. So if you need to import a design from XD into Figma, you can just select the import option, drag your XD file into there. And uh, this, this also works in reverse. So yeah, you can, you can uh, import your XD layers into Figma, make that an editable uh, file that has exactly the same layers, exactly the same uh, structure, and everything can be edited in uh, Figma. And so this, this can be really useful. It does other things like it lets you just export Figma designs into After Effects. So if you want to do motion design, uh, that can be handy. You can import Google Docs. You can do all, all, all kinds of different formats uh, through that one. And the last example I'll show you on this one is just importing an Illustrator file. So we've got this AI Illustrator, Adobe Illustrator file, uh, vector file of these bears. We want to get them into Figma so we can actually edit them in there. So once again, we'll just select the Import Adobe Illustrator option drag and drop that in there, and in about two seconds you get your fully edited, editable um, vector from uh, Adobe Illustrator. So you can go in there and really do whatever you want with it. It's just, it's just a normal vector layer at that point. Okay, so this is the last one. 
uh, I, I rebuilt this plugin three times before it ever came out because it's um, it's it's a tricky one uh, to get to get right. I can probably give a whole another talk just on this one plugin. Uh, I think about eighty percent of my support is for this plugin, not because of the plugin, but because every email marketing platform is just a nightmare, and this integrates with all of them. So I get every customer of these platforms uh, emailing me. But it's it's a, um, it's the plugin that I'm most proud of and solves the uh, pain that I most hated when I was working in agencies. So Emailify allows you to design and export responsive production ready HTMLs from Figma. And I'll show you what that looks like now. So uh, I've started working on an email here using Emailify to design this Airbnb uh, template. And I've got a whole bunch of components that I can quickly spin up. Uh, you can also totally do them from scratch, but this is just a really quick way of doing it uh, if you know what layout you want. So all I'm going to do is modify this. I'm going to drop in uh, some new assets. So I'm just going to replace some of the images. So we'll add that image in from our desktop, drop that in, apply uh, some styles to it. So you can just style the elements as you normally would in Figma. Everything is auto layout by default. So you know you get a lot of that uh, benefit for free. Uh, it's just going to copy in some content just as you normally would. And of course you can style it in Figma as you normally would. And then we're also going to add a CTA. So if you want to add a button, you can do that with one click. There's a ton of different components and uh, primitives you can add really quickly. Again, all auto layout. So all I'm going to do is just change the color, uh, apply some styles. So again, you can obviously just brand this to whatever your brand is. There's no opinionated uh, design imposed on you. You can basically design whatever you want. And we can see what that looks like inline. So we just preview that inline. This is uh, real HTML being uh, shown here. And I realized I didn't show it, but you can actually change the, the viewport size. So it defaults to iPhone to force you to think about what it's going to look like on mobile, otherwise no one ever will. Um, and so you can do that um, and change the size to desktop, you know, desktop or larger uh, widths as well. Um, but in this case, we also want to add uh, a couple more elements. So we're going to drop in the you know typical uh, App Store download. We'll drop that in and style that up. And so you can see, you know, this has been going for what, maybe 60 seconds. So you can see how quickly it can be to do this. But the cool thing is once you've built these out, you don't need to rebuild them. Uh, the, the plugin has a component library built into it. So you can actually go to the component library tab and load up all the components you've already designed and uh, use them with one click in the same sort of UI as well. Uh, so that's basically what it looks like there. And now that we're happy with it, we're going to export it to HTML. So you just click one button. You can either export it just to an HTML package, or as I said, you know, upload it automatically to like 20 different email platforms just using like APIs that you just paste in, and it handles it all for you. Um, again, you get this cool um, preview page. All the assets are exported, obviously, and uploaded um, if you want to. And again, you can send this preview page. So you get a view of what it looks like on the large screen, what it looks like on the small screen. Uh, there was some mobile overrides applied to the font. That's why it looks bigger on uh, the larger one and smaller on the other one. Um, but you can send this to a client and they can see uh, what the real HTML looks like side by side. If you really want to, there's also a feature to export it to PDF, which takes the rich HTML, real HTML, and exports it into a PDF. I don't know why people need to do this, but they, they apparently do. So um, that's, that's also in there. So uh, yeah, those are the demos. and. Um, I would I would just finish up on the last shot of the Truman Show. Sorry if you haven't watched it. Um, you should watch it. Maybe watch it tonight. Um, but you know, so I just kind of conclude with saying that best practices can be useful. You know, we've kind of touched on why they exist, why they can be useful, why they're so hard to change. Um, but they certainly aren't always true. And I think that we uh, really need to get get back to uh, being more on the side of questioning them rather than blindly adopting them. And so to uh, you know, take the app, uh, famous uh, Apple marketing line, I would say we, we really need to think different. So uh, thank you and sorry.